Welcome to a lecture on the geology of Long Island um, as it pertains to how the Ice Age processes that created Long Island uh, created the landscapes that we live, live with today. Uh, my name is Dr. Brett Bennington. I'm a professor of geology at Hofstra University. And this lecture was developed as part of the Green Tree Foundation Teachers Ecology Workshop Series. Um, but I hope that anybody who watches it will find it uh, informative and, and useful. So um, if you live on Long Island, it's important to understand the physical setting of Long Island and the geologic uh, history and the geology of Long Island, because these are the things that explain um, the, why Long Island is the way it is. It's physiography, it's habitats, and it's uh, resources. Um, it's a pretty interesting place. Uh, we, those of us who live here kind of take it for granted, but um, Long Island has a tremendous variety of coastal environments, for example, because of the way it sort of sticks out sitting on the continental shelf. It's surrounded by estuaries like Long Island Sound and, and the, the southern bays, the eastern bays, a couple small bays on the northern side as well. Um, we have open ocean environments along the, the barrier island shorelines. And then we have all these interesting landscapes, um, which um, and again, you know, we probably don't pay much attention to them, but if you stop and think about them, they are kind of unusual. Uh, and one of the things that geologists do is that we, we work to under, understand landscapes. We want to understand the origin of landscapes um, because there's sort of a two-way process here. Um, the processes that make landscapes explain the, the landforms, but we look at the landforms and we look at the materials that they're made out of to understand what those processes were. Um, and Long Island uh, provides a really, some really wonderful examples of, of this kind of investigative work. So what do I mean when I say Long Island is composed of a variety of unusual landscapes? Well, if you think about it, um, you know, it's a pretty, pretty strange place. Uh, we have um, lots of uh, flat, uh, flat lands, flat sloping plains, uh, particularly along southern Long Island and central eastern Long Island. Um, there's a ridge that runs across the middle of Long Island and extends out into the ocean to form the South Fork. There's another ridge that runs along the northern part of Long Island uh, and joins up with the shoreline and extends out into the ocean to form the North Fork. There are these uh, extensions of land separated by deep harbors, um, the necks of Western Long Island, which uh, are very pronounced to the west and then they sort of become less pronounced in the central part of Long Island and then they disappear completely uh, along the eastern um, shore of, of Long Island Sound. Um, the uh, highest points of land are associated with these uh, regions of hills in the central western part of Long Island. Um, most of our rivers flow from about mid-island uh, towards the south shore. We have very few uh, streams and, and rivers on the North Shore. Um, this very interesting sort of bumpy hilly topography associated with the ridges and north of the ridges in Western Long Island, which is in contrast to the smooth topography um, that we see south of the ridges. Uh, so there's some very interesting landforms that, that we uh, would like to be able to explain. Um, if you want to see what Long Island is made out of, the best places to go are along the shoreline where um, the subsurface of Long Island is being cut into by waves as Long Island erodes along the coast. So places like uh, Comset State Park will um, show you in these beautiful beach cliffs uh, the layers of material. And, and what, you see, what you see at Comset are lots of layers of sand and gravel. This is a type of deposit that we call outwash. Uh, you also see a very different looking material exposed in the, in the beach cliffs around Long Island. 
this is a non-layered material um, with uh, sand and gravel and clay, and then very, very large boulders embedded in it. And we call this material till. It can be observed at Comset State Park. Um, it can be observed in the cliffs out uh, along the South Fork, along, out, at, out at Montauk. Um, again, where, wherever the ocean is eroding into the body of Long Island, it's exposing the material that Long Island is made out of. And these are fairly distinctive uh, geological materials. We can, we can figure out where they came from pretty easily. Uh, another interesting sort of material that's found around Long Island are these very, very large boulders, which are made out of types of rock that are not found on Long Island. Um, in fact, um, there is no bedrock exposed on Long Island. Uh, Long Island's bedrock is hundreds, if not thousands of feet um, below the surface. It's hundreds of feet below the surface under the North Shore, thousands of feet below the surface uh, by the time you get to the South Shore. And then the only bedrock exposure on Long Island is, is a little place up in uh, northwestern Queens. Um, so these boulders uh, must have come from somewhere else. And that's why they're referred to as erratic boulders, which erratic uh, from the Greek meaning to wander. These are wandering boulders. Um, and the boulders aren't just sitting on the surface. They're actually part of the subsurface of Long Island. They are found within the till. So here's a photo taken at Plum Island, which is an extension of the North Fork of Long Island. And you see these enormous uh, erratics um, buried in the material of the, of the till. Uh, Long Island's largest erratic boulder, and there, there are several very large ones. What is arguably the largest one is located uh, in Manhasset. Uh, it's called Shelter Rock. It's immortalized in uh, the name of Shelter Rock Road. Um, and the boulder, the boulder is on private property, on uh, property owned by the um, Green Tree Foundation on the former Whitney Estate, but it is visible from the road, and there's a little little historical marker that that discusses it. Um, so these layers of sand and gravel, these um, masses of sediment of all sizes, including these enormous glacial boulders. Um, we can, we can look for an agency that is capable of creating all of these different uh, types of deposits of geological material. And that agency was, was first um, noted back in the mid 1800s by a Swiss geologist named Louis Agassiz, uh, who coming from Switzerland was familiar with glaciers uh, and uh, glacial ice and the kinds of deposits that ice was capable of making. And when he uh, explored the Northern Europe and eventually um, came to the United States, uh, New York and, and New England, uh, Agassiz saw the same kinds of deposits that he saw associated with the uh, activity of glacial ice uh, in, uh, in Switzerland. And he preferred, was the first person to propose that there had been an ice age in the recent past where enormous uh, glaciers had moved across Europe and across uh, northern North America, uh, leaving behind all of this material. Uh, so glaciers are, are the, the agency of the formation of, of Long Island. And if you want to understand Long Island, you need to know something about glaciers, about ice and what it can do. So uh, glaciers are, are interesting sort of dynamic systems. Um, you will make a glacier if you have the condition that more snow falls in the winter than melts away in the summer. If that is the case, then every year um, snow will accumulate. And as snow accumulates, it compacts into, into ice. And so as long as you're making more snow in the winter than you can melt away in the summer, the ice will build up. And as ice um, builds up, it flows like a liquid under the influence of gravity, under its own weight. And it basically flows outward from wherever it's accumulating and will continue to flow outward until it reaches a point where um, the edge of the mass of ice is melting as fast as it's being replaced by more ice flowing. Um, sometimes the ice will reach the shoreline and, and as it advances into the ocean, it melts very rapidly. So, so glaciers can't really travel too far out into the open ocean before they break up into icebergs. And, 
and that may come to an end. Um, otherwise, the ice will continue to flow until it reaches an area where it's sufficiently warm that it's melting as fast as it's flowing. So if the rate of accumulation of ice is greater than the rate of melting, then the edge of the glacier will advance. It will move um, usually either to lower latitudes or to lower altitudes. And as the ice flows along from where it's accumulating to where it's melting, it moves across the landscape. It, it way, you know, it's very thick, it's very heavy. It is capable of plucking material from the bedrock, bulldozing up whatever soil and deposits of sediment are there and trapping this material in the ice and, and carrying it along. So as the ice flows, um, rocky material within the ice is transported as if it was being carried by a conveyor belt. Um, when the margin of the glacier reaches a position where it's melting as fast as the ice is flowing, then the position of the edge of the ice, the, the edge of the glacier stabilizes. And year after year after year, it might look like the glacier isn't moving, but the ice is always moving in a glacier. The ice is always flowing um, from where it's accumulating to where it's melting. And as the ice continues to flow and melt away, it carries whatever rocky material it picks up and that material ends up um, at the uh, building up along the margin of the glacier, what we call the terminus of the glacier. And then if um, conditions change and the climate warms up or you get less snowfall in the wintertime, uh, so that the rate of melting exceeds the rate of flow, then the edge of the glacier will, will retreat. The ice doesn't actually move in reverse. The ice is always flowing forward, but if it starts to, the front of the glacier begins to waste away, the edge of the ice will, will move backward. And if it does retreat like that, it will leave behind a big pile of glacial um, sediments uh, that we call a moraine. And Moraines will incorporate all of the material the glacier, the ice was able to carry. Uh, the sand, the clay, the silt, the boulders, the pebbles, everything ends up there. Um, if the glacier restabilizes at a different position, then it will continue to convey our material to the terminus of the glacier and build up another pile of, of glacial glacial sediments. So uh, the glacier I was standing on in the first picture I showed um, was the Athabasca Glacier up in British Columbia in Canada. And this is a photo of the Athabasca, Athabasca Glacier taken from the uh, highway that goes past it. And you can see there are lots of ridges of this uh, glacial sediment um, that are um, stretching across the landscape at different positions, showing you former positions of the ice. So at some point uh, in the not too distant past, the front of the ice was all the way up to the foreground of the photo here. And then the ice has been retreating. It's the glaciers around the world have been in retreat for the last 150 years or so. And, and that retreat has accelerated with, with global warming. The inset photo here shows where they, they bulldozed through the moraine um, to build the road. And, and you can see what, um, what the moraine is composed of. And it's a non-layered non mass of all different particle sizes. It's this material we, we call till. And we see quite a bit of this on, on Long Island. Uh, glaciers are tremendously dirty. Um, that's, that's one thing that you notice immediately if you visit an actual glacier. The ice isn't, isn't like ice cube ice from your refrigerator. It's full of pieces of rock and um, bits of sand and silt and, and mud. The, the meltwater streams that drain off of glaciers are usually milky because they're carrying so much very, very finely ground rock flour suspended in the, in the flow. Um, it's not unusual to see piles of, of sediment sitting on top of the ice. And you look at those piles of sediment and you kind of scratch your head and you say, well, how did those get there? It looks like somebody drove a dump truck up onto the glacier and offloaded uh, you know, a few cubic yards of, of sediment. Well, 
th this is this is an important clue to sort of how glaciers create landforms. Um, what you have to imagine is, is that at one point the ice was thicker um, when the uh, glacier was further away from from the, when that ice area of the glacier was further away from the terminus. And there were some depressions that had been melted into the ice and any of the, any water flowing into those depressions is carrying uh, sand and mud. When it flows into the depression, it, it slows down and drops the sand and mud and eventually the depressions on the ice fill up with, with sediment. And then as the surface of the ice melts down, um, as the ice reaches the warmer part um, further down the valley, uh, the ice around those depressions melts away and what you're left with are the contents that were formerly sitting in the depression, but the depression is now gone. And when the ice melts away completely, those piles of sediment will just be left sitting on the ground, on the landscape, and they will form landforms on the landscape. So this is a very important idea. We call it ice landscape inversion. Uh, basically, when the glacier is present, um, wherever you have ice as a positive feature, when the ice melts away, you will have a negative feature on the landscape. And wherever you don't have ice will tend to build up as sediment is deposited and washed out from underneath the ice. And so a negative space between the ice or in front of the ice will fill up and become a positive space on the landscape. So if we kind of think about this, this photo here, or the, this uh, diagram here, where you have uh, the edge of the glacier, here's a proglacial lake, which is formed between the ice and, and some hills here. Um, you have this, this broad, flat area that's built up as sand and gravel are being washed out from under the ice and, and um, you know, sort of deposited in sheets uh, in front of the glacier. You have some stranded blocks of ice that have been buried in the sand and gravel being washed out from under the glacier. If we let the ice melt away completely, this is what we get. We get a landscape where the land is actually higher, where the ice wasn't because as the ice was melting, the landscape was built up. Um, we get depressions where there were blocks of ice that eventually melted away. Um, we have the moraine, the ridges that mark where the front of the ice was, and then additional ridges that mark where the ice retreated to and stabilized. So we have what we would call a terminal moraine or an end moraine, uh, and then these recessional moraines. Um, there are often features that are either hills or tunnels, uh, or hill, I'm sorry, hills or valleys um, that show where ice was flowing or where water was flowing in tunnels under the ice. And then that lake that was sitting in front of the ice drains away when the ice is no longer there to act as a dam, and you're left with um, essentially a big flat muddy area from the mud that settled out at the bottom of the lake. And what was a delta building out into the lake is now a, um, a little, little section of hill that's sitting up above what was once the, the lake bottom. All right, so again, the idea here is that, that the negative features um, on the landscape get filled in by sediment and become positive features and the positive areas where there was ice become, become negatives on the landscape. Here's an example of a valley in Alaska that has been deglaciated as the glacier has melted up the valley and it's left behind all of this uh, dark uh, sort of bumpy material that's glacial till um, melted directly out of the ice. This large hilly feature here is probably a delta that build out, it built out into a proglacial lake that was there because the ice was further down the valley and formed, formed a barrier or a, um, formed a dam, essentially. You have these depressions in the, in the landscape where there were blocks of ice sitting that got buried and then eventually melted away. And then the sort of lighter colored smooth material, all the sand and gravel and silt that got washed out from under the ice to form a smooth uh, kind of a broad um, outwash plane. So not just the material, um, the till and the outwash,
but the landforms that are produced are distinctive of, of glaciers. And then these big boulders of bedrock that either fall from the uh, sides of the valleys or get plucked up uh, from the bedrock underneath the ice are very common features of, of glaciers and they, they get carried by the ice uh, towards the, um, the um, terminus of the glacier and when the ice melts back they're simply left sitting on the landscape. And some of them can be quite large. So when you look at uh, a shoreline uh, along uh, some parts of Long Island, or in this case, Plum Island, which is just an extension of the North Fork of, of Long Island, you see lots and lots of these enormous boulders um, associated with either outwash or till deposits. Uh, it's, uh, it's not difficult to, um, to imagine uh, a former landscape when this whole, whole area was covered by ice. And if we look at what are the, the rocks and boulders that are found on Long Island made out of, what kinds of rocks do we find? We find the same kinds of rocks that we see to the north um, in Connecticut or uh, in the New York metropolitan area further west. Um, Connecticut is uh, made up of two regions of metamorphic and igneous rock uh, separated by a central region that has a lot of sedimentary and then uh, a different kind of igneous rock. This is the Connecticut Valley. Um, and we find um, rocks that, that match up with the types of rocks seen uh, to the north, uh, making up the, the glacial erratics and, and cobbles of, that are found on the, on the North Shore and, and central Long Island. Here are a few examples of uh, rocks found at Comset State Park. Uh, this uh, sedimentary rock here, the siltstone with leaf fossils, this is actually not from the glacial material. This is from the layers of geological material that the glacial deposits are sitting on. This is much older coastal plain geology, which I'm not talking about in this lecture. Uh, we'll save that for, uh, for another, um, another lecture when we uh, talk about sort of the, the foundation of, of Long Island. Uh, these other rocks here are metamorphic and, and meta-igneous rocks that are typical of the rocks of uh, southern New England. Now, besides the formation of moraines and outwash plains and the deposition of glacial erratics, there's another um, glacial uh, phenomenon which is particularly important for understanding on Long Island, and that's the formation of tunnel valleys. And a tunnel valley is a valley eroded into the surface under the glacier when the material that the glacier is riding over is not solid bedrock. Um, meltwater flowing uh, through a tunnel along the base of an ice sheet uh, isn't going to be able to erode its way down through solid bedrock. But if the material the glacier is riding over is sand uh, and, and clay that's compacted but not, not solid rock, that material can be eroded into. And it turns out that the, the older material under the glacial deposits of Long Island is not solid rock. Um, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of feet of compacted uh, sands, gravels, and clays. Um, and uh, so the, uh, the meltwater flowing under the glacier was able to erode down into this, to, to actually carve valleys into the material beneath the glacier. So we call these valleys tunnel valleys. And Long Island has lots of tunnel valleys. In fact, almost all of the valleys uh, along the North Shore of Long Island were produced not by streams, but by uh, meltwater flowing through tunnels under glacial ice. And we can illustrate this. So let's, let's imagine, uh, well, we're looking here at a digital elevation model of the western um, north shore of Long Island. This is uh, Manhasset Neck and Little Neck and just a, a portion of Great Neck uh, off to the right here. Um, you can see the, the, the glacial moraine, what we call the Harbor Hill moraine, uh, running across the center of the uh, image, the smooth outwash plain below, and then this the, the, the narrow deep uh, harbors, harbor valleys um, that separate the, the necks. 
So imagine, if you will, and then the, the star is the location of the um, Green Tree Foundation property, and we're just going to use that as a, a point of reference. So imagine that the glacier has, um, has advanced down and it's stabilized along the north shore of Long Island. Uh, what's happening? Well, again, that, that ice is not static. The ice is continuously flowing. Uh, towards the, the margin of the glacier, and then um, by the time it gets to the margin, it's melting away, um, producing tremendous amounts of, of liquid water, which drains out from the front of the ice. So you have to kind of imagine being able to look below the surface of the glacier and um, look over a period of time to notice the ice flowing, um, moving south towards the, the terminus, uh, and then melting, and, and some of that some of that ice is evaporating, but a lot of the meltwater is sinking down into tunnels and crevices in the ice and building up at the base of the glacier, where it accumulates in and, and then flows along through tunnels out towards the front of the glacier. As it's flowing through these tunnels at the base of the glacier, it's eroding down into the surface below, uh, picking up lots of sand and gravel and silt and, and and clay, and then when the uh, when the meltwater reaches the margin of the glacier, it comes gushing out, and it just deposits all of that sediment uh, and builds up this uh, area to the to the south, away from the margin of the ice. And so these meltwater tunnels end up eroding deep, narrow, uh, steep-sided valleys beneath the ice, and then all of the material being transported out from under the ice builds up uh, in a, a series of coalescing outlaws, outwash fans to form the smooth outwash plain. So we can easily explain the peculiar topography of northwestern Long Island with these distinctive necks and narrow harbor valleys and the elevated landscape south of the moraine um, through this process of, of tunnel valley tunnel valley activity. And Long Island isn't the only place in the world you see, you see this. Um, this is not peculiar to Long Island. Uh, here is a digital elevation um, model of a portion of moraine, uh, the Sturgis moraine in Michigan. And um, what you see here looks remarkably like the western north shore of Long Island. Um, you have these elongate extensions of built up out of moraine, out of, out of glacially deposited uh, till, separated by these um, narrow uh, valleys where the meltwater was flowing under, under the ice. And then um, away from the moraine, you have this uh, elevated, smooth outwash plain that, that was built up. When I first saw this diagram, I saw it as part of a, a graduate student poster at a meeting of the Geological Society of America, and it, and, and it just um, stopped me in my tracks because it looked like I was looking at the, the North Shore of Long Island. Right, so this happens wherever you have a, a large continental ice sheet um, that stabilizes and then um, you know, is able to erode tunnel valleys and, and then deposit um, lots of, of sediment to build up an outwash plain. Here's a view of uh, northern uh, Long Island from the Northport area. There's Eaton's Neck, Lloyd's Neck, and then Oyster Bay. Um, and again, you see something very similar. You have uh, these um, narrow north-south trending uh, harbor valleys, the tunnel valleys. You also have smaller tunnel valleys that, that some trending north-south some trending east-west, so, so the meltwater beneath the ice forms a kind of an anastomosing network of tunnels that etch themselves onto the unconsolidated um, older material underneath to form this very distinctive landscape. And then the elevated outwash plain. These, these um, regions of hills that we see uh, intersecting the, the southern moraine, what's called the Ronkonkoma moraine, um, so we have the Harbor Hill Moraine here to the north, and then the branching off from that is the Ronkonkoma Moraine. These um, regions of hills that form uh, Dix Hills and West Hills and the Jericho Hills um, 
Minetto Hills, um, these are not terribly well understood, and I'm not going to talk a lot about them because I don't really understand them. In fact, uh, no one's yet come up with a, a very um, uh, comprehensive explanation for what they are. They look like uh, deltas that built out um, from meltwater emptying into a standing body of water, like a big glacial lake, but it's not clear that's actually what they are. So uh, until we know more about these, I'm not going to say too much about them. Uh, instead, let's, let's focus on the tunnel valleys of the North Shore. So again, this is the North Port, Center Port, um, Huntington area. And um, you can see that south of the, of the Harbor Hill Moraine, the landscape is very smooth. North of the Moraine, it's very hilly with these, um, with these narrow valleys. I actually grew up right on the crest of the Moraine and spent most of my childhood riding, uh, you know, bicycling through all of these uh, valleys. And one of the interesting things about tunnel valleys is they don't have streams in them. They weren't, they weren't eroded by streams. They were eroded by meltwater under a glacier. So they, they're disconnected from, from streams usually. I mean, I mean, some of them do have streams because they're deep enough to intersect the water table. And so streams developed after the tunnel valleys formed. The, the valley was already there before the stream appeared. But most of them are above the water table and, and you don't see any evidence of, of streams ever having flowed through them. Uh, one thing about tunnel valleys is because they're eroded by meltwater beneath a glacier under pressure, water under pressure can flow uphill or downhill. So some tunnel valleys uh, start at sea level, uh, trend uphill, and then drop back down to sea level. You see that in a, in a couple of places, all right? Uh, rivers don't flow uphill, so a river can't erode an uphill valley, but uh, um, meltwater uh, under pressure certainly can. Um, in the center port, uh, center port uh, north port area, so this is center port harbor in the center of the image to the left and north port harbor um, to the right, which are two tunnel valleys that connect up and then intersect the, the um, Harbor Hill Moraine. So basically this was a major conduit for meltwater to escape from under the glacier. And then you can see there's a shallow channel that wends its way um, to the south where the meltwater um, that was coming out of that uh, tunnel valley uh, flowed along. Uh, depositing material, you can see that uh, uh, further, further east here, a tunnel valley associated with Bread and Cheese Hollow Road um, that continued as a channel to the south here uh, is filled in. The channel's filled in by the material that was deposited coming out of this tunnel valley. So the impression we get is that these tunnel valleys were active at different points in time. Um, a bunch of meltwater might find its way to the margin of the ice and, and, and disgorge very rapidly, depositing a lot of sediment and then sort of exhaust itself and then later on, on another sec under another section of the glacier, another pocket of meltwater would work its way out to the front of the ice and, and disgorge. Uh, if we look at a um, profile across the uh, moraine in the Northport region, um, look at the change in elevation. What we notice is that uh, the land to the north of the crest of the Harbor Hill Moraine is actually lower than the land to the south. And that's because to the south of the moraine, the landscape was built up layer by layer from all of the material, all of the sediment being washed out from under the ice um, and accumulating uh, as the glacier drained to form this uh, elevated outwash fan. Another interesting thing about tunnel valleys is not surprisingly, um, they are natural um, conduits, natural passageways. And so most of the, uh, most of the roads on the North Shore uh, follow the tunnel valleys. Um, so if you're north of the moraine, the roads are often, um, you know, they, they developed within the tunnel valleys. Uh, south of the moraine, the, you can have more of a grid pattern because the land is essentially flat and there isn't any, there aren't any natural features to control where the where the roads are built. Port Jefferson Harbor is a beautiful example of a tunnel valley that intersects the crest of the Harbor Hill Moraine and then 
there's a large fan-shaped deposit of outwash uh, to the south of the Tunnel Valley. So it's easy to imagine meltwater flowing out from under the glacier and then disgorging and spreading out this uh, broad um, fan of material um, building out away from the source. And then uh, over here, we can see uh, another tunnel valley and what looks like a shallow channel where meltwater was probably um, flowing a little bit later, eroding uh, a shallow broad channel across the, the um, outwash plain that had formed a little bit earlier. Um, another uh, sort of distinctive aspect of Long Island uh, where when you're, when you're in the areas um, with where the moraines are is a very bumpy sort of uh, landscape, what we call came and kettle topography. Uh, this is a picture taken um, in a nature preserve in the Northport area that shows what came and kettle topography looks like uh, from, from the ground. So we have this sort of broad circular depression. This is a kettle hole. Um, kettle holes are places where large blocks of ice were stranded and buried in the, in the sediment uh, wasting out from the melting glacier. And then after when the ice block finally melts away, you're left with a big space in between. Um, in between the kettle holes, you have these bumpy uh, hills, which are the opposite of a kettle hole. A kettle hole is where ice was buried in sediment. A came hill is produced where a hole in the glacier filled up with sediment and that pile of sediment was left behind when the ice melted away. And then to the lower right of the photo, you see a large uh, glacial erratic, uh, part of um, that was embedded in the glacial till uh, that, that somebody has uh, painted an eyeball on. And that's, you have to be careful. Those glacial erratics can, can get you sometimes. Uh, so this, this bumpy sort of kettle hole, came hill topography, is very distinctive uh, along the, the north shore of Western Long Island. It's also found uh, along the moraine, the Ronkonkoma moraine, which runs across central Long Island and across the, the northern part of the South Fork, which is an extension of the Ronkonkoma moraine. You can see it, this again, this very bumpy Cayman Kettle topography in the digital elevation image here. Um, and then you see what appear to be tunnel valleys. Uh, these again, uh, sort of broad, uh, or I'm sorry, narrow uh, valleys that intersect the moraine at, at, at right angles to the trend of the moraine and that typically have uh, channels associated with them uh, further to the south, um, probably uh, eroded by the meltwater that was emptying out of the tunnel valley when the ice was positioned along the, along the moraine there. Just a, a closer view of the of a tunnel valley, came in kettle topography in the in the Southampton area, and then the, the smoother outwash plain. And then you see lots of circular depressions in the landscape. These are kettle holes um, left behind by stranded blocks of ice. Uh, kettle holes uh, often produce ponds. Um, the water that's in a kettle pond isn't the, the meltwater left behind from the glacier. Um, you get kettle ponds when your kettle holes are deep enough that they intersect the water table. If, if a depression intersects the water table, water will, from the water table will, will fill the depression and you get a lake or a pond. And there are kettle ponds. Uh, most of the kettle ponds are found in Eastern Long Island and that's simply because Western Long Island is, is overdeveloped. And many, many kettle ponds have been um, drained and, and filled in. Uh, Lake Success is an example of a large kettle pond. Uh, lake Ronkonkoma is probably a kettle lake, uh, but it's, it's very large. It's, it's unusually large for a, a kettle depression, but we don't have a better explanation for it. And then there are lots and lots of, of kettles um, associated with the uh, North Fork and the South Fork. So again, a kettle pond uh, forms when an ice block depression is deep enough to intersect the water table. Um, kettle holes or ice block depressions that don't intersect the water table, often kettle holes will fill up with water from snow melt or spring rainfall um, during part of the year and then dry up for the rest of the year. And, and 
these, uh, these bodies of water, these ephemeral bodies of water form vernal ponds, which are ecologically very important on Long Island. Um, vernal ponds are places where fish can't gain a foothold because the fish can't survive the part of the year when the pond is dry. So during the spring when the pond is wet, uh, they, these vernal ponds become important breeding grounds for insects, um, invertebrates, and, and uh, particular amphibians, uh, frogs, toads, and, and salamanders. Um, there are also um, just shallow depressions uh, along the, the lower parts of the south shore of Long Island that form what we call coastal plain ponds. And again, coastal plain ponds can be permanent bodies of water if they're low enough to intersect the water table, or very often they will form vernal ponds um, if they only flood for part of the year. There's a Google Earth image of Lake Ronkonkoma, which has the appearance of a kettle depression lake. Uh, it's just unusually large. That would have been one really enormous block of ice that formed that depression, which, you know, why not? By the way, um, one of the most common questions I get about Lake Ronkonkoma is, is it bottomless? Um, for some reason, a lot of people uh, have the impression that Lake Ronkonkoma is either bottomless or that uh, it, it, it's deep enough that it connects up with the ocean in some way, that you could literally dive to the bottom of Lake Ronkonkoma and keep swimming until you emerged into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, both of those ideas are obviously um, Wrong, you know, not true. Uh, it's just a, it's just a fairly deep depression filled with fresh water. Uh, here are some other examples of uh, kettle ponds uh, in uh, northeastern Long Island, Lake Panamoka, Deep Pond, North Pond. Um, quick word about um, aquifers. Uh, Long Island is a large pile of sand and gravel that is sitting on hundreds of feet of layered sand and gravel, uh, older, older layered sand and gravel. Uh, so there's a tremendous amount of pore space in all of this material that can hold water. So Long Island has um, tremendous uh, aquifers beneath it that we rely on for our drinking water. And the water that's in our aquifers comes from rain and snow that fall on the surface of Long Island. And about half of the water that falls is precipitation on the surface percolates down into the subsurface. It flows underground. Most of it flows through the shallower aquifers. Some of it gets down into the deeper aquifers. And then eventually that water returns back to the surface where it feeds our streams, lakes, ponds, uh, wetlands. And then the water that, that, the fresh water that doesn't return to the surface in the interior of Long Island discharges along the coastline and it's that constant discharge of fresh water along the coastline that keeps the salt water uh, from Long Island Sound and the ocean from moving underneath Long Island. So this, this natural system of fresh water flushing um, from the surface through the interior of Long Island is what provides um, our fresh water supply and, and our drinking water. Um, we don't usually drink the water that's in the glacial material because it's been contaminated by septic waste across much of Long Island, we go down into the deeper layers for our drinking water where the water is uh, more pristine. Uh, here's a, an image from uh, Western uh, Long Island Udall's Cove in Queens, New York along the North Shore, where at low tide you can see fresh water discharging back to the surface from the groundwater system and then emptying out into, the, into Long Island Sound here. And again, this discharge of fresh water is important because the fresh water coming out keeps the salt water from seeping in. And just a, a couple of important points about our fresh water supply. Um, this I'll, I'll try and cover in a, in a separate lecture um, at a later date. But uh, again, the, the water beneath our feet on Long Island in, in our aquifer system is supplied by rain and snow. There's no other way that fresh water gets, gets to Long Island. The groundwater beneath our feet is, doesn't just sit underground, it's constantly moving. And when it comes back to the surface, as it inevitably does, it feeds the surface water systems. It discharges and feeds our streams, our ponds, and, and discharges along the coast. Um, 
if we didn't have that groundwater discharging, we would see our streams and ponds dry up and uh, the saltwater move in under Long Island. When we pump groundwater to use it, we are taking water um, and putting it into our, our wells and into our water towers that otherwise would be going somewhere else to a pond, a stream, or to the coastline. So if we pump too much groundwater, we will see the amount of water flowing through our streams and in our ponds and flowing out along the shoreline decrease, uh, which we have over much of Long Island. And anything you do to the groundwater system will eventually manifest itself in our surface water systems. If you pollute the groundwater, you will eventually see that pollution come back to the surface and enter streams and ponds and bays around Long Island. And that's, those are important ideas to, to keep in mind. Um, one problem that we have on Long Island with uh, groundwater is that across much of Long Island, where we don't have sewer systems, uh, we send our septic waste um, into septic pool or cesspools and private septic systems where it drains into the, um, into the ground, into the upper glacial aquifer and introduces um, a lot of uh, nitrogen pollution into the groundwater. And that nitrogen pollution doesn't stay in the groundwater. Again, the groundwater comes back to the surface. So that nitrogen ends up in our lakes and streams and ponds and in our bays. Um, where it creates uh, all kinds of ecological problems associated with essentially over fertilizing um, surface, surface water bodies. So 70% of the nitrogen, for example, in Moriches and Shinnecock Bay uh, has been shown to be coming from uh, septic systems and not from fertilizer and not from the atmosphere. Um, in Western Long Island, where we have sewers, we have a different problem. We don't have so much of an issue with septic nitrogen because we don't have so many septic systems. Instead, um, what we've seen is a decrease in stream flow uh, over the last 50 years, and 50 or 60 years, as um, we have installed more and more sewer systems. So what happens in Western Long Island is we, um, we pump groundwater, we use it, and it ends up going to a sewage treatment plant, and then it ends up being emptied out into the bays or into the ocean and that water doesn't get back into the groundwater system. So we're taking water out of the groundwater system, we're not putting it back. And that has had a huge impact on stream flow, which you can see in this graph here, which shows uh, for a bunch of streams on Long Island, the essentially the percent of historical um, water um, discharging into those streams from the groundwater system. And this three, I've highlighted three streams, uh, one in red, one in blue, one in green. This is uh, Valley Stream, um, Pines Brook, and the Mill River in the Hempstead area, and Meadow Brook, which runs along the Meadow Brook Parkway. And um, we started sewering Nassau County in the 40s and 50s. And as there were more and more homes connected to more and more sewer systems, uh, in Western Long Island, um, we can see how the flow in those three Western streams um, began to drop uh, to the point where, um, where Valley Stream and, and uh, Pines Brook in Valley Stream and West Hempstead almost stopped flowing completely. Um, they became mere trickles compared to what they used to be. And there's been some recovery um, in the last uh, couple of decades uh, as less and less groundwater has been pumped uh, further west in Queens, um, the water table has recovered a bit and, and more and more water is, is discharging. But still, um, these western streams are not flowing with nearly as much water as they were 100 years ago. So that just illustrates the, the impact. In Suffolk County, the streams have not seen this kind of impact because um, in Suffolk County, without having a lot of sewers, the water that's used, that's, that's removed um, through public supply wells and used, is being put back into the aquifers. Um, it's polluted when we put it back, but at least we're putting the water back. So there's been less of an impact on stream flow in Suffolk County. Um, speaking of rivers, lakes, and ponds on Long Island, uh, we have um, four major rivers 
on Long Island, the Nisiquag, the Conaquat, the Carmens, and the Peconic. Uh, it's interesting that um, the Conaquat and Carmens rivers appear to be flowing through valleys that were probably uh, carved primarily by glacial meltwater and not by these rivers themselves. The Peconic River is really the only sort of normal river on Long Island in the sense that it's uh, it's it's a river that's 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 coming off of a large drainage area, um, and uh, that that has uh, essentially eroded its own valley. The the other rivers and streams on Long Island are occupying valleys that were eroded for them um, by glacial meltwater in in one way or another. Um, the Nisiquag, uh, the Nisiquag may be. The Nisquag may be flowing through a tunnel valley, or the Nisquag may have eroded its own valley. I'm not, it's not. It's not 100 clear. Now, if you look at uh, this, is a map of Long Island that shows the depth to the water table, and basically, um, northern Long Island uh, has most of the elevation and the water table is relatively deep, uh, often uh, over 100 feet below the surface uh, across most of northern Long Island. Southern Long Island is closer to sea level. Uh, the surface is closer to sea level. The water table is shallower. So most of our streams on Long Island are located um, across the southern part of Long Island, and they flow from about mid-island uh, down to the south. Um, Northern Long Island has very few uh, rivers and streams. Um, the Nisiquag is really the only river in the northern half of Long Island. And, then, and most of the small streams that are found uh, are, are very short and very, very close to the, to the shoreline. Um, and again, that's, that's simply uh, uh, caused by the, the fact that southern Long Island is, is lower and closer to the water table than, than the northern half of Long Island. Um, so again, most of most of our named uh, streams uh, that have any any kind of considerable extent are located um, on the southern half of Long Island. There are very few streams in the central part of Long Island. Um, now, streams on Long Island, uh, some of them, um, a couple of them, like the Nisiquag and and the Peconic, uh, seem to have carved their own uh, their own valleys, but um, other uh, rivers like the um, Conaquat River and the Carmens River uh, appear to be occupying uh, meltwater channels. And, and I say this because the valleys that the streams occupy intersect the Ronkonkoma moraine, which suggests that, that, that the, those, those gaps in the moraine and those valleys existed um, before the uh, glaciers had melted away completely. Um, the rest of the streams on Long Island occupy what are called dry valleys that have their that that begin south of the Ronkonkoma moraine. And what's a what do we mean by dry valley? Well, we call these dry valleys because um, in the northern part of the of the valleys, there is no stream currently. The streams that flow through these valleys are only found in the southern extent of the valley. So so portions of the valley systems are, are dry currently dry. And there's Lake Ronkonkoma. Um, an explanation for the, I mean, how do you carve a valley without having a stream in it? Well, one suggestion would be, well, maybe in the past the water tables were higher. And so the upland extent of those valleys was, was able to intersect the water table. The problem with that explanation is sea level has been rising continuously since the end of the last ice age. So it's highly unlikely that water tables in the past were significantly higher than they've been in the last uh, couple hundred years or so. Um, certainly water tables are lower now, uh, particularly in Western Long Island because of, because of sewers and because of our pumping and groundwater. Um, but even even a hundred years ago, um, before we were pumping a lot of groundwater, these these the northern extent of the valleys on Long Island was still dry. Um, so it turns out that the explanation for dry valleys is that the valleys were were carved 
um, shortly after the uh, Long Island was deglaciated, when the subsurface of Long Island still contained permafrost. Um, and what a layer of buried permafrost was able to do uh, was create an, an elevated water table because the, for a while, water that would seep into the surface of Long Island would hit the permafrost below at a shallow depth and, and couldn't drain any further. So the permafrost kept Long Island's water table elevated that allowed um, these valleys to form, these uh, southern valleys to form uh, from, from drainage, um, from precipitation and drainage. And then when the permafrost melted, the water table dropped and that's when the valleys became dry and they've remained dry ever since, uh, except again in the southern reaches where um, the, they intersect the water table. So uh, if you plot on a map the historical uh, northernmost extent of the headwaters of streams across, uh, in this case, western Long Island, um, the historical headwaters do not reach the northernmost extent of the valley. So, so portions of all of these modern um, stream valleys are dry, uh, which again calls for um, the valleys having been formed um, in, the, in the distant past um, when Long Island was still, uh, st still had a layer of permafrost underneath it. Uh, here's some pictures of Pinesbrook in West Hempstead. And uh, again, Pinesbrook um, is a stream that, that is probably, well, not probably, is definitely kind of a, a ghost of its former self. And in fact, um, some sections of Pinesbrook and West Hempstead will periodically dry up uh, if we haven't had rain for, for a few weeks and the, and the water table drops. Um, and this, this is an artifact of, of our um, sewering and, and pumping of groundwater in Nassau County. Um, all of the streams on Long Island have been uh, impacted uh, tremendously by the, the European settlement of Long Island. A good example is uh, the Mill River watershed, which is uh, in the Hempstead, West Hempstead, Malvern, Oceanside part of, of Long Island. Um, prior to uh, European settlement of Long Island, um, the tributaries of the Mill River, uh, which include Pinesbrook and uh, Shodak Brook, uh, flowed into Mill River, which had its headwaters up in Garden City, um, flowed through downtown Hempstead. In fact, there was a small tributary that, that also flowed through downtown Hempstead, and these streams flowed unimpeded uh, to, the, to the bay. Uh, beginning in the uh, six, late 1600s, 1700s, European settlers started damming the, the, the streams to produce ponds uh, so, they could, um, so they could harvest ice in the wintertime, so they could uh, have water to irrigate their livestock and, and crops, and so they could power mills to grind grain um, and, um, and, and also in some cases to make paper. Um, so by the uh, mid 1800s, you had a whole series of mill ponds um, along the uh, Mill River watershed. And in the modern watershed, uh, some of those mill ponds uh, still exist as, as uh, reservoirs. Um, um, in Hempstead Lake was developed uh, as a large reservoir, reservoir to um, serve as part of the water supply for Brooklyn in the 1800s. Um, another impact on uh, modern impact on the Mill River watershed is um, there are sections of the streams which have been completely buried underground in culverts and, and so the stream disappears completely. Uh, this, this big gap in the stream in the Pinesbrook stream in Malvern is where Malvern High School is now located. Essentially the playing fields of the high school are built over what used to be a stream which is now running through a concrete tunnel underneath. Um, roads, the, you know, block the, well, the, the streams are, are culverted under, under roads and highways like Sunrise Highway 
So the whole hydrologic system has been uh, sort of fragmented and, and disrupted. And this has had a big impact on, on fish populations. Um, being uh, coastal river systems, um, there are lots and lots of fish which migrate from the ocean to the streams and back. Uh, they're called diadromous. Uh, they spend part of their life in the ocean, part of their life in fresh water. Uh, some like the American eel um, live in fresh water and return to the ocean to spawn. Others like um, alewife and, and certain types of trout um, live in the ocean and come upstream uh, to spawn. And when we build when we built these dams and, and these culverts, um, we, we basically prevented these fish from doing what they, you know, naturally do. And so we prevented them from successfully reproducing. Uh, so there are lots of historical runs of what are called river herring and different types of, of salmonids, um, Atlantic salmon and trout, uh, different types of trout. Uh, and many of these historic runs where fish would return upstream every, every year to uh, reproduce um, are now blocked. And this has had a big impact on, on these fish populations. And in the case, for example, of river herring, these are important uh, fish, food fish for the larger oceanic game fish that, that people like to fish for and that uh, seals depend on and, 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 and also uh, whales depend on. So, um, we've really disrupted the coastal ecosystem by controlling um, these streams. And there's uh, an environmental movement uh, on Long Island to try and restore uh, fish, fish passage along the streams of, of Long Island uh, by either removing dams or by um, installing fish ladders and fish ways to allow the, the migratory fish to, um, to return to their spawning grounds. Um, and, and to restore the natural ecological function of these, uh, of these rivers. So if we just kind of go back to the, the features of Long Island that we've been talking about. Um, so we have our, our moraines, these, these ridges of hills, uh, the Harbor Hill Moraine, which uh, is south of the North Shore of Western Long Island, and then kind of joins up with the coastline to the east, uh, where it's referred to as the Roanoke Point Moraine. And uh, on the east end of Long Island, the, the crest of the moraine is right up against the shoreline. The reason for this is, is not that there were never necks of land uh, and, and tunnel valleys along the eastern part of Long Island. There were. The eastern part of the North Shore of Long Island started out looking like the western part of, of Long Island, but uh, the wave energy coming off of the open ocean through Plum Gut uh, has been able to erode away the, the necks and straighten the shoreline all the way back to the moraine. And you can see that process is, is happening um, in central Long Island here. Um, and it's happening much more slowly in Western Long Island where Long Island Sound is narrow and you don't have big waves and you don't have so much wave energy. So the North Shore is eroding uh, much more slowly in Western Long Island Sound than it has been in Eastern Long Island Sound. Uh, and then we have, as we've discussed, the, um, the, the elevated outwash plains, these, these smooth um, built up areas of uh, mostly sand and gravel um, in the subsurface of Long Island. Um, the Ronkonkoma moraine, these, these unusual hilly features, which we're not sure what they are. And then the Ronkonkoma moraine, which extends all the way out to, to Montauk Point. Um, one of the interesting ecological features of Long Island are grasslands, historical grasslands um, that once formed prairies, uh, expanses of nothing but, but, but uh, grasses um, and, and shrubs, no trees. Uh, the most important um, grassland on Long Island uh, historically was the Hempstead Plains, which is located, uh, well, it once, was once located on the Outwash Plain, um, bounded by the Harbor Hill Moraine to the north and these, uh, these lobate regions of hills um, to the east and, and to the south, um, just by the shallow water table. 
Um, so the Hempstead, uh, Hempstead Plains was a tall grass prairie uh, where the, the, the grasses um, like a great blue stem have really, really deep roots that, that go way down uh, to, to reach this, this deep, uh, deep water table. Um, there were other grasslands uh, located on the Outwash Plains across Long Island, uh, most of which are now essentially gone. There's just a small remnant of the Hempstead Plains located near Nassau Community College. Um, development has, has taken over the, the grasslands and replaced them with uh, tracts of housing and, and trees. Um, Long Island's uh, soils uh, differ tremendously in, in their fertility, um, largely because of differences in the distribution of uh, this very, very fine um, mineral rich uh, sediment called lus. And lus is wind blown sediment that is associated with glaciers. Um, Basically, uh, glacial ice as it flows uh, grinds away at the bedrock beneath it and pulverizes the rock without chemically weathering it and, and breaks it down into a very, very fine, uh, silty uh, to, to dusty material, um, but doesn't chemically degrade it. So, so the mineral nutrients that were, you know, the different minerals that were present in the bedrock are still present in this finely ground material. And then when the ice retreats, um, it leaves lots and lots of exposed sediment, which dries and then as winds blow away from the glacier, um, this fine material can be picked up and carried um, for great distances before it finally settles out. And, and what happened with Long Island was when the ice retreated up into Connecticut, the Long Island Sound Valley was not flooded with water. Sea level was very low. The, the shoreline was 100 miles away from Long Island um, off to the east. And so uh, for a while, you had this uh, expanse of, of land without vegetation, uh, kind of a tundra um, with lots of, of, of drying sediment, glacial sediment exposed at the surface and winds that came off of the glacier from the, the cooling of the air and the descent of air would flow, would have blown across the Long Island Sound Valley, picked up a tremendous amount of this very, very fine dusty rock flower carried it south. And then when those winds hit the, the hills along the north shore of what's now Long Island, the winds slowed down, depositing um, this very, very fine material as layers of loess that, that are found particularly along the North Fork and uh, along the, the northern uh, hills of Long Island. And this loess forms very, very fertile soils. Uh, in part explaining why the North Fork is so good for agriculture. Um, further south, uh, there are regions of Long Island where the Lys didn't make it to. It, it, the Lys was deposited and didn't get any farther south. And the soils here are made up uh, mostly of, of quartz sand um, washed out from under the ice and chemically highly weathered. So you have some very, very nutrient poor sandy soils across parts of Long Island that, that form the Pine Barrens. Right, so the Long Island Pine Barrens region is um, partly um, the reason why you have Pine Barrens there is, is these, these nutrient poor, uh, very, very sandy soils. And then uh, on you know, the different forest types that grow on Long Island uh, grow in different places because of differences in the glacial material. Um, glacial till has a lot of clay material. It, it holds water better, drains more, um, <clears throat> more poorly than the outwash soils. And so depending on, on what kind of glacial material you have in the subsurface, you will get different uh, patches of, of of forest communities across Long Island. And then finally, it's worth noting that Long Island is, um, is nothing more than a big pile of sand and gravel, uh, which is eroding away at a rate of about a foot a century. 
Um, and so Long Island is an ephemeral feature. It was born around 20,000 years ago at the peak of the Wisconsin glaciation, the last ice age. It is entirely possible <coughs> that there were previous Long Islands uh, formed during previous ice ages. Uh, we have no way of knowing because those uh, former Long Islands would have been eroded away by during the interglacial periods by coastal erosion and then eroded away by the re-advance of the glaciers. <coughs> um, and this is what's happening to Long Island presently. Um, Long Island will not uh, exist for a long time, um, a few thousand years, probably. Um, not really our problem, not my problem, but something to think about. It's a, we live on an, a, a very uh, changeable, very ephemeral um, landscape feature. So thank you for uh, listening in. Um, hope you enjoyed this lecture, which was developed as part of the Green Tree Foundation Teachers Ecology Workshop, uh, sponsored by, um, in part, by the SeaTac Environmental Association and Hofstra University. Uh, thank you. <laughs>